Welcome to the Swell Suite, everybody. Today, our special guest is Eric Depredine of Zydeco Meadery. So not too long ago, Eric sent us a message. He reached out to the podcast. He wanted us to be aware of this program that he participated in very recently. It's called the VESTA program. So VESTA stands for Viticulture, Analogy, Science, and Technology Alliance. So it's a national grape and wine education program that combines the flexibility of industry validated online instruction, instructor guided education from industry professionals, and crucial hands-on mentor experiences at vineyards and wineries that are near you. So Eric tells us all about his experience with Vesta and how he became a mead maker. For your convenience, I've added the Vesta program link in the description box. Let us know if you have any questions and enjoy the episode. Cheers. Welcome to the Swell Suite, everybody. Happy Wine Wednesday. Tanisha and Glennis, hey, y'all. Hey. Bye. Happy Women's International Day. Exactly. exactly. And thanks to our guests for sharing it with us. So that'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Glennis, your wine looks really good. What is that? You like my favorite. It's Turley Red Zen. Very nice. You know, I love me some Turley. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be on your payroll. Yeah, for sure. See, put it out in the atmosphere. <laughs> put it out in the atmosphere. Exactly. <laughs> oh, thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you. How, how have you ladies been? What's been going on? <sighs> Tanisha, what you been up to? <laughs> no, nothing and everything. All right. Okay. Nothing and everything. Uh, I'm following your stories. You're you're doing a lot of guest appearances lately. I'm talking too much. I need to shut up and sit down. <laughs> That's what I need to do. <laughs> need to shut up and sit down. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of guest appearances, working on my current season of uh, my podcast, where I'm interviewing um, American expats in France that are involved in food and or beverage. Gotcha. So that's nice. been fun. So it's kind of like a little riff off of uh, Emily in Paris, but talking to real people who live here in like real life. And well, they're funny. Uh, so it sounds really it's interesting. interesting. I, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, it sounds interesting. It sounds like everybody's perspective is going to be different. Yeah, it is. Um, and based on their part and whether they're in wine or spirits or food, it's different where they're from in the U.S. makes mm. it different. But we all have one common thing that everybody has talked about uh, so far, and that's language. And that's learning the language and the problems mm. with that. So that's oh. always comforting to hear other people be like, oh, no, this was hard. And it's people who were like, oh, no, I majored in French in university, but I still had this whole entire problem wow. when I moved here. So um, that's good to hear. Uh, working on the second edition of the Wine Bar Guide that will be finished and complete at the end of this month. Good I am job. adding in, I'm adding in like 15 new bars. Mm. It might end up being more than that, but of course I have to try them out first. I got to, you know, of course. I can't just be, I can't just be sending people anywhere. So, yeah, of course, that's what I'm doing. How is, 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 um, Paris completely opened up? Oh yeah. And starting on the 14th, the mask mandate is over and we don't have to show the health pass to, um, go in restaurants, movie theaters and stuff. We'll still need the masks in public transportation and long distance trains. But other than that, they're like, ah, oh, just go ahead. Spread your germs everywhere. <laughs> Live your best life. So well, there's that. Oh gosh. Fingers crossed for our I have one. I have one question for everybody. Um, has anybody tried the Old Bay Vodka? No, really? Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that was a thing. Well, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Um, Old Bay. Really. It's like if you, are you about to pull out? Do you have it? I have it. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't um, know why I'm surprised you got it. I was getting ready to say, Tanisha. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> that's like saying, oh, and water is wet, huh? That's strange. <laughs> oh, I don't have it with me. I was going to pull up a picture. My bad. 
No, I don't have it. You got it. I was, don't, I was, girl, I was, gonna, I was gonna try it. You got, though. You, you got it on it? order. It's okay. Yeah, I can see it. You got it on order. It's coming. I don't. I don't know. When is it, when is it being delivered, Sarita? <clears throat> Shut up. I don't know. When's the shipment come in? Stop playing. I did not. You order. know, it's probably really good in a bloody mary. Bloody mary. That's what they have in the article, a bloody mary. Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh. With a crab claw piece of shrimp. Olives, felt oh, good grief, yum! Right with the celery stirrer, y'all, y'all, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> Does everybody here like Bloody Marys except me? <laughs> yeah, probably. I, I love Bloody Mary. Okay. Yes. Yeah, my oh no, my palate has. I don't know. It's not there. It makes so, me want soup. It makes me want to eat. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what you do. <laughs> savory. <laughs> You do eat with a Bloody Mary. You, it's yeah. Mm-hmm. I just have trouble like uh, just drinking it. I would, like in a shoes. It, ah, no, I can't. it took me a second to get into it. I didn't always like it because now if you hand me a cup of tomato juice, I'm a like punch you in the face. But it's like, different. That's gross. With a Bloody Mary. Absolutely. I was getting ready to ask you, Serena. Do you not like um, tomato juice? Is that the issue? oh? I mm-mm. I don't like tomato juice at that's, all. Tomato yeah. juice is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> the, mix, the mix is you put some vodka or some gin in it well i am i am all for it okay what you say yeah. leslie i think the mix is delicious like when i fly this is so weird but i will just ask for the mix the bloody mary mix yeah yeah that's the i don't understand what that I'm means you mean the mix like the the bloody no, mary there, oh what they make it with yeah mm-hmm. they, they, they have bloody mary mix period then you just add vodka to it Oh. So the Bloody Mary mix is already spiced with what, like Worcestershire and all, all this other okay. stuff. Okay, interesting. Depending on and the not, brand, yeah, not and just some is spicy, yeah. and not just tomato. Man, yeah. I remember going to a media brunch at this wine bar uh, in Brooklyn, and um, everybody was ordering their sort of brunch cocktails. I had an espresso martini. I got really attached to those in the past couple of years. But um, the Bloody Marys came out and they were gorgeous. They were so pretty. Oh, yeah. I was like, I really wish I liked it. it I want to drink it. I want to like it. But nah, not I was um, I was on my way to Jamaica. and We connected. It was the weirdest connection, right? D.C. to Philly, Philly did nonstop to Mo Bay. I was like, damn, I could have walked to Philly. But that's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> but the bar that was right next to the gate. If that bartender didn't make the best Bloody Marys and wow. the accoutrements that came with it was standing yeah. up like it was just like a breakfast of champions. And I was I kept trying to then I wanted to fly through Philly just to go to this bar to get these Bloody Marys. But I would never be in the same damn conference. So I gave that dream. Yeah. What makes a good Bloody Mary? Oh, what makes a good way? I guess the. The vodka for me, yeah, I have to have a nice vodka. So the spice vodka is like the mm. thing now. Okay, um, you yeah. got to have lime. I like mine a little spicy, so the right hit of um, spice in it. Um, the you know, wish to see a sauce, just a little bit, not too much. Some I've seen some uh, mixologists throw a little um, garlic in there. Um, definitely, it really turns me on when I see shrimp hanging off the side. Yeah, mm. yeah. A piece and, of bacon, yeah, and also not too thick and not too not thin. Too th- like sometimes yep. they can be really thick, but then I also yeah. don't like them super thin either. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Ugh. Well, I'll try it again one day. But anywho, and so olives. Spe- and oh, and the olives. Okay, gotta have the olives. All right. Leslie, how are you? Any updates you want to share with the folks? Um, so we started officially our tours last weekend. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. And All right. One of, well, we, we still have the mask requirement in the vehicle because, you know, in public transportation, you still should be wearing your mask, even though this is private transportation. And we have the requirement of, uh, your VAX card, or a negative COVID test. And so we had our first person who didn't bring it. Mm. 
on our tour. How'd work out? So that person rescheduled their tour. Oh. Oh. Oh, you're not playing around. I I am very serious about making sure that people don't catch COVID on our tours. Yeah, most mm-hmm. definitely. Our um, um, our wineries a wineries doing tasting is tastings and tasting rooms again yet? Yes, they are. Okay. They okay. are. They have they have moved inside. Um and some of them have gone to a uh, a tasting menu versus tasting. Oh, okay. Okay. They have come back. Yep. Awesome. Wow. So this will be interesting to see how this evolves. Yeah. Over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we have a special guest with us today, Eric Depardine. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Swell Suite. Swell Suite. I can even talk. Welcome to the Swell Suite. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, Eric. I'm like, what show is that? (laughs) Where are we? (laughs) And I'm not even drinking. (laughs) So, Eric, um, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, once again, my name is Eric, and I'm married with two kids. I live in the rural portion of Kansas City on a small farm consisting of uh, three and a quarter acres. I have four beehives, three dairy goats, one horse, and 29 apple trees. Um, Our trees are a mix of aromatic, bittersweet, and bitter sharp apples from New England, North Carolina, England, and France. During the week, I'm employed by KC Water Services as Kansas City's pretreatment coordinator. Uh, that program has 82 industries where I monitor industrial wastewater discharges for city and federal compliance standards. This is my seventh year working for Kansas City and my 11th in, uh, in the environmental field. Wow. I, wow, I'm so impressed. So, so back to your land. Did you grow up a farmer? No, I grew up in the projects of Boston. Huh? What was that like? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, growing up in Boston was interesting because it was atypical. Uh, I grew up in a large Puerto Rican community called Villa Victoria. My mom's family moved there in the late 1970s from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, When I first went to school, there was a kindergarten in my neighborhood and it was bilingual. So I learned how to speak Spanish at a very early age. Boston also has a large West Indian population and uh, we participated in many cultural events and especially during the summer months. And I also played the steel drums. Now, we lived in our own little world in Boston. I've looking back at it, I've realized that we lived a segregated life in the Northeast, which was very, very separate from the dominant Anglo culture in Massachusetts. You could probably extend that to like Hartford, Connecticut as well, and New York, um, the urban part of New York. So, uh, we lived in our own world. We, sh- we, we went to school in our own world. We celebrated in our own world. Now, employment options were different. Yes, we had to work with um, Anglo-Americans and, and other immigrant groups. But at nighttime and on the weekends, we socialized by ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's a shame. Um, I didn't see parts of Massachusetts until I was 36. And I'm 38, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm 38. So that was pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. Right before, right before <laughs> COVID. <laughs> so it, was a, it was an interesting experience. It was um, growing up in the projects and in our Im- immigrant enclaves in Boston. I learned a lot about our Caribbean culture. Um, my dad's family is from North Carolina and I didn't really have an appreciation for, for 
African-American culture in North Carolina until I moved to Louisiana for as a college student and taking history courses and learning, learning more about the great migration and the similarities between um, life in Eastern North Carolina and Louisiana and the foolishness that all, all African-Americans and black immigrants had to experience Mm -hmm. um, in the Northeast, it took me leaving Massachusetts to have an appreciation for that. Because like I said, I grew up in a very insular looking community of first generation Trinidadians and stuff. Even though I'm half American, I didn't, I didn't have a, a full appreciation of my dad's side of the family until I left. Interesting. What part of North Carolina is your um, dad from? My, my dad was born in Boston. His mom is from Washington County, North Carolina. Washington County. Okay. Right on the Aber Marl Sound. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. My mother's from Wallace down on that. On the in Wilmington on the coastal side of North Carolina. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Right down the I-40. That's interesting. So what got you from Boston to Kansas City or was it from Louisiana to Kansas City? It was Boston. I left Boston when I was 17 to go to to go to university mm -hmm. at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I stayed in Lafayette, Louisiana up until 2015. Um, that's when I got a job in a, a job offer in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. okay. So I spent quite a bit of time, more time than anyone in my family expected I would in Louisiana and became um, creolized <laughs> as a point where now my Massachusetts relatives sometimes get irritated with me because sometimes my Trinidadian food tastes like um, South Louisiana food. <laughs> I can't eat Trinidadian pepper sauce anymore. Now I use pepper sauce from uh, Louisiana. Saint Yes, St. Martinsville, <laughs> Louisiana. So, oh, that's interesting. interesting. I am not mad because uh, Leslie's family is from Louisiana, also. Oh, okay. So you I can tell the spelling of your last name. He's um. Hello? I was going to say because I grew up when my cousins went there, they called it USL. So you can tell that you're a few is years. Your family younger. from St. Landry Parish. Yes. Yeah, I could tell because um, Dean Cottenham. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to continue to speak standard American English and not slip into my Lafayette accent because <laughs> now I realize you're from Lafayette. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the vice presidents of UL or USO, um, Dean Patricia Cottenham. I think her maiden name is Freelo, but it's spelled F R I L O T. L -O -T. Yeah. And her people yeah. are from uh, Plaisance and Prairie mm -hmm. Rhone. That's right. the original spelling of our last name, but we yeah. changed. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that figures, Leslie. Glennis, okay. I love you. I love you more. <laughs> <laughs> so I read an make, article. To make oh. it easier for people to pronounce. Well, and that they makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. So, uh, Eric, I read an article um, uh, that profiled you, and it said that um, you learned about the beverage, sort of like the beginning of your beverage history started with your grandmother in Trinidad. Is that true? Yes, in a way. Um, my my mother's family, like I said, came up here in the 70s, and my, my grandmother used to make a non-alcoholic beverage using hibiscus flowers. Oh, I love hibiscus. In English, it's called sorrow. Mm -hmm. They have the same beverage on the west coast of Africa and Nigeria and Ghana and in Senegal. And um, folks in Veracruz, Mexico, call it Agua de Jamaica. Um, my grandmother and my dad's family, additionally, they don't have a background in alcohol manufacturing. Um I just was, I just wanted to experiment 
using my grandmother's non-alcoholic beverage recipes. And I wanted to see if those recipes could be translated to an alcoholic beverage using <laughs> honey. So I would substitute the cane sugar for the honey as the fermentable sugar. And it took a lot of experimentation because when my mother and my grandmother make these beverages, they usually make one to two gallons and they eyeball a lot of ingredients. There's no measurement. Um, you might buy a pack of an, an ingredient and dump that into your larger stock pot and you eyeball it from there. That works if you're just cooking for your people, but that doesn't quite work if you, if you want to scale up your recipes. So it took a lot of phone calls and a lot of um, critiques from my grandmother and my aunts before I got her hibiscus recipe down pat. Um, I've also developed a recipe for my grandmother's ginger beer recipe using apple juice, um, freshly pressed apple juice and honey as a fermentable sugar. Um, I also have a recipe for Moby, which is a, it's a non-alcoholic beverage, but the Arawak and the Taino Indians made a beer using the bark from this tree that's native to the Caribbean. Unfortunately, the TTB does not recognize that as a, they don't, they don't allow Moby to be used as an alcoholic as an ingredient in alcoholic beverages without there being a, um, a grass, which is basically a, it's a scientific study proving that it's safe for alcoholic manufacturing. Even though it has been used since pre-Columbian times as, a, as an ingredient in alcohol beverages, they still need to see scientific proof that it's safe because no one else in the United States has, been, has done that. Whereas hibiscus has a history of being used in, high, in alcoholic beverages in the United States. So that's why I don't have the Moby or my Tej recipe on the market right now because the, uh, the TTB and the FDA say Moby bark and gesho sticks from Ethiopia are not, have not been proved to be safe for alcoholic manufacturing in the States. So how did you, uh, like, what made you say, you know what, I'm going to recreate this recipe and get it down packed and try to sell it. When my wife and I were dating, we would drink Riesling and get Wistriminer from Washington state. And we decided to go on a honeymoon in the Puget Sound region. We visited about seven different wineries in Western Washington state. We had so much fun that we decided to continue visiting wineries, this time in Louisiana and East Texas. After talking with enough people in the region, we said, hey, this is something that we could possibly do um, as a side hustle or later on in life when we retire. The only problem is, and, and like y'all know, vinifera grapes are not, vinifera grapes do not tolerate the subtropical climate of the Gulf Coast because of bacterial, um, bacterial issues with the plant and pest problems. Louisiana has an abundance of honey because a lot of commercial beekeepers, especially if they're in the migratory beekeeping business, overwinter their beehives in Louisiana and Mississippi because the flowers bloom earlier down there than in places in the Midwest. It's a good way to build up your population so your hives are real good and strong before you take them out to California to pollinate almond trees. So we always had plenty of honey in Louisiana. And it was cheap. It still is. So I, I bought a book on Amazon years ago, I think in 2011, that um, explained the process of mead making. I think it's called The Complete Mead Maker by Ken Scram or Shram. He's, he owns a commercial operation in Michigan. And it was a basic um, honey, water, and yeast mead. And then I started playing with different fruits. Fortunately, we live close to a, a fruit orchard owned by Mr. Eddie Romero in Iberia Parish. 
he has he and his wife have a small cattle operation and um a large orange grove and uh muscadine grape vineyard and uh peach orchard so depending on what time of year we would my kids and i would go there harvest about 50 to 100 pounds of fruit bring it back to Opelousas to be processed make my wife upset because my kids and I would tear up the kitchen and we would combine that juice with a diluted solution of honey and water and then we make a fruit-based meat out of it we started we did that from 2011 up until 2015 when we moved to Kansas City and um we continued doing it in Kansas City, but when I got to Kansas City, I decided to um, take formal classes at a local community college on um, alcohol manufacturing. Is that where you were with the VESTA program? Yes, ma'am. And so tell us about that, because when you contacted me, you um, you specifically pointed out this program and you wanted us to make sure that a lot of our listeners knew about this program. The VESTA program, um, I'm going to try to do my best to explain it. It's a, a, consort, a consortium of 11 state universities and community colleges in the United States, primarily in the Midwest, with a few on the Atlantic coast. It gives students the opportunity to take classes in analogy, I have my notes, so I did, did not want to mess this up. Uh, it gives students the opportunity to take classes in, in analogy that either can lead to a certificate, pro, a certificate in analogy or viticulture or an associate's degree in, in those subjects. I decided to take the analogy path because it made the most sense for me at the time. I didn't have property to plant a vineyard and like y'all know it costs at one time fifteen thousand dollars per acre to install a vineyard here in the midwest so that was how i couldn't have i couldn't do that um so the analogy program the certificate path consists of uh two analogy courses a course in sanitation equipment operation wine microbiology a wine sensory class and two internships that total 200 contact hours. When you are doing your internship, you do it at a, there's a list of wineries in each state that participate in the VESTA program and students have to contact the, the owner or the winemaker and coordinate their schedules with the winemaker schedule so you can learn how to process fruit during harvest in August, September, and October. Um, how to make sure you sanitize everything in 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 the production production area, process that fruit, ferment the fruit. Um, how to do chemical analysis on on the wine as it's going from a must to to wine, making sure you have a healthy fermentation um racking the wine or cider off the lees aging it bottling it you learn all of that you're gonna be involved and it's it sounds like a lot and it is a lot but you'll be amazed how many hours you can accumulate um especially during harvest because you're out there with the winemaker or the owner's family harvesting the fruit you're bringing it in you're processing it you can easily knock out 12 hours like that so i suggest if this is something um you could do it at any age i i was about in my mid-30s when i completed it it's easier if you can complete it while you're younger when you have less responsibilities (laughs) um because 200 contact hours is a lot if you're working a full-time job and it was for me um but it's a great opportunity especially if you don't have the ability to take in-person classes. VESTA has an option where you can log into, um, I think it's called Blackboard. And there's a, like a Zoom, a Zoom portion of Blackboard where you can um, digitally, there's a digital classroom and you can listen to the lectures and interact with other students throughout the United States. 
if um, if you're unable to go to one of the community colleges on a Saturday and take classes. I know there are community colleges and state colleges on the Atlantic and Pacific coastlines, but for those that live in the Midwest, those class, those universities and schools are out of reach geographically. So best is a good way to fill in that gap for a lot of students and it's affordable. I think uh, at, when I was taking classes, if it was the online version, I think it was like four or $500 per class, which is, if you have responsibility, that's a lot of money, but compared to going to a regular university and spending two and three thousand dollars per class per semester it's a bargain you know and i think the classes um i did in person and online classes my community college was highland highland community college which is about 100 miles west from my home and i would drive there on a saturday stay out there for about eight hours do lecture and lab work and then just drive home afterwards when certain classes weren't offered at the community college, I took them online and they were maybe an hour or two on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, um, like at seven or eight o'clock at night. You do your papers, you interact with your classmates digitally, virtually, excuse me. And um, that's how you complete your coursework. So how would um, our listeners find the VESTA program? Is it, um, do you have the web web address or? Yes, ma'am. So they can look it up? It is V-E-S-T-A hyphen U-S-A, that's all one word, dot org. V-E-S-T-A hyphen U-S-A dot org. Excellent. And um, there's a, Somewhere in the drop-down menu, it shows you the, the the eleven universities and community colleges that are part of the consortium. But you don't necessarily have to be an, an enrolled student at those institutions in order to take the classes. You can be a student at large through Missouri State University West Plains, and just do everything online. Like if you live in, um, I don't know the northern part of New Hampshire, the northern part of Maine, where, you know, they don't have those types of classes available. You can do everything online. So it's a, it's been beneficial because it, um, I like to describe Vesta as the mortar between bricks. You know, I had a, I have a bachelor's of chemistry from the University of Louisiana. So that also helped in a way, because it helped make sense out of a lot of things. I was about Plus to say, oh, you probably breeze through this program with a degree in chemistry. Nah, you still got to study. You still got to study. Um, but it wasn't that hard. It wasn't that hard. It's, uh, it provided me with a foundation to explain why you need to sanitize and be religious about sanitization. Um, sanitizing your equipment because you don't want spoilage microbes affecting your um, your juice or your must. And it teaches you the various spoilage microbes and there's a sensory um, portion as well where you learn different smells and you get you associate different smells with different tastes because you're using your nose and your mouth together in order to translate what um, eno, I forget the, there's a Greek term that describes the different, uh, the different tastes, organic chemical tastes that you can get out of wine, whereas if it's plum or if you're tasting lychee or green pepper in a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and all that other stuff, you know, it, they teach you how to translate that into into words um now it's nothing on the level of you know it, it's nothing on the level of being a sommelier you know that's that's a whole nother thing but um it just gives you that particular class gives you a basic understanding on how to translate those organic chemical senses 
into words without having to use a, a spectrometer. So for a second, let's go back to your property. Um, how many apple trees and how many um, beehives do you have? I have four beehives. Um, I have my bees are carniolian, which are a uh, bee species, honeybee subspecies from Germany. And I have uh, 29 apple trees. Because grapes are so prohibitively expensive, yeah. I decided to tap into my Massachusetts roots that I didn't know I had. <laughs> and um, like the USDA office in my county says, oh, Eric's trying to become a uh, Johnny Appleseed <laughs> in Western Jackson County. So uh, apples are much more, the cost of entry to become an apple grower is a lot lower than becoming a grape grower. Do you make and cider? I do. I do make, um, I make commercially, I make two ciders. One's called Kansas Sizer, which is a dry cider and Kansas wildflower honey and a New England style cider, sizer, excuse me, um, that is a combination of apples from New York and Kansas mixed with um, Massachusetts knotweed honey, which is a member of the buckwheat family. So the honey is very, very dark red, almost brown. And it has a very strong molasses-like taste. And I fermented it with, um, a couple pounds of raisins to add a tannic element to it. And then I back sweetened it with the Massachusetts knotweed honey. The allure of being a viticulturalist is really great because of all the beautiful images you can see of Europe and of California and Washington walking through the vines, but it's expensive. I told my wife, I have this crazy harebrained idea. I wanted to plant a peri pear orchard which um, these are pears that you normally wouldn't eat. You would, you would use them just like um, cider apples. Um, these pears either have too much tannins or they're too acidic. But when you convert that tannic or acidic juice into um, pear wine, it's, um, it's, a real pleasant, it's a real pleasant beverage. So... We have hopes on planting hopefully 20 pear trees later this fall. If I, if all the stars are aligned correctly, I can purchase this uh, one acre plot in urban Kansas City and plant it with pear trees later this year. So how long will it take for them to mature that you'll be able to produce something from them? It typically takes about You'll start to see fruit in year three, but if five years to get a good crop, assuming you don't have issues with um, pest or bacterial issues, um, that, in other words, you got to make sure you stay on top of your spray schedule. I know some people are able to grow fruit organically, more power to you. Um, it's difficult to do that here in the Midwest because of the swings in climate. As we all are aware, there is something called climate change, whether or not people want to um, admit it exists. And because of climate change and bug issues, you don't have a choice. You, you have to spray your apple and pear trees and, and your grapevines. But to answer your question, um, it takes about five years before you see a crop. So uh, before we move to our next segment, um, tell everybody where they can find your mead. You don't distribute or anything yet, right? That's correct, ma'am. Um, our, our volume, our production volume is so, so small. I think last year we did a little bit shy of 400 gallons. This year we may get up to like seven, seven or 800. So a distributor is not going to, they're not going to uh, take it, take our account. If you live in the Kansas, if you live in the state of Kansas, you can find my meads at the Park Park Place Farmers Market in Leewood, Kansas, the Lenexa Farmers Market in Lenexa, Kansas, the Mission Farm and Flower Market on Thursdays in Mission, Kansas, and the Moonlight 
market in Shawnee, Kansas. All four markets are located in Johnson County. If you are driving along I-70 on your way to Manhattan, Kansas, there's a small town called Wham Eagle where the Wizard of Oz is um, Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. That's our hometown. Wham Eagle has the incubator where I manufacture my meads and you, we have a tasting room. So you can taste my products as well as the college's wine and the other two winemakers that rent space from the college. Do you ship? And the wine? Not yet, ma'am. I okay. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Gotcha. Any other questions for Eric before we close out with some rapid fire questions? Oh, just one, Sarita. Thank mm -hmm. you. So back to the store and the high, well, for others, for the folks that don't know, hibiscus, the, the, the drink become it's called sorrel in certain um, Caribbean countries. Um, like you said earlier, so are you doing any type of hibiscus slash sorrel drinks at all? Yes, ma'am, I am. It is, um, it is the most difficult product I make because yeah. as y'all as y'all are aware, to have a healthy fermentation, you have to have a source of nitrogen in your juice for your yeast to be happy while it converts 50 to 500 gallons of juice to wine. Mead doesn't have any nitrogen. So mead makers have to, that's one of the, that's one of the differences between being a mead maker and a cider maker and a wine maker is the lack of nitrogen. And because of the flowers, the flowers when they're rehydrated add extra compounds to the juice, quote unquote, that can inhibit or slow down the fermentation. So we're constantly having to make small nutrient additions periodically to make sure my yeast are happy in the tank so it can convert those sugars into alcohol. My hibiscus my grandmother does not know, and I've told her, <laughs> I don't know how much, my grandmother is 95. Um, oh, she lives bless. in a nursing home in Boston, in Dorchester. And I tell my grandmother, I say, you don't know how, how you have helped to make me famous. That drink by far is my best seller. I can imagine. I can imagine. I'm trying to figure out how I can get some <laughs> over here. <laughs> Well, I have but, another batch fermenting right now, so I'll email Miss Sarita for y'all's um, for y'all's address, and I'll put something in the mail for you. Thank but you, I'll, Sarita. Uh, has both addresses on speed dial now. <laughs> <laughs> we will but love I will that. Tell you, it is not easy to make hibiscus drinks as it's not easy to make fermented hibiscus drinks because wow. hibiscus flowers have a lot of phenols in there. Mm -hmm. And those phenols can um, oh, form colloids, which are these huge macro molecules that can that are a pain in the neck if you don't right. find a way to get them to fall out of sus fall out of suspension. They can make your life difficult when you are filtering your wines. So mm -hmm. I have to use an enzymatic product from. Um, Scott Laboratories out in California. It's um it's an enzyme that attracts the macro polyphenolic compounds, makes them fall out of solution without stripping the sorrel of color. Wow. I could do the same thing using bentonite, which is a clay, but it'll <laughs> strip color and it'll strip aroma. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Um, I go through a lot of trouble with my hibiscus beverage, but People in this region love it because they've never had anything like that. And once I tell them the story about how um, captured African women brought the seeds in their hair via the transatlantic slave trade to the Caribbean and uh, the Gulf of Mexico coastline in Mexico and northern South America, they're like, wow, I never knew that. And I'm like, yeah, there's a whole... 
there's a whole story behind that, you know, <laughs> and I, for my African American customers at the farmers markets, I'll explain to them how um, hibiscus beverages in the Caribbean and in Latin America serve the same purpose as strawberry beverages during Juneteenth. You know, when you have a big celebration, you usually drink something that's red. Mm -hmm. and, um, hibiscus is subtropical. You can't grow it in parts of the United States. So strawberry flavored beverages serve that purpose because somebody was trying to tap into a distant memory back in 1865 and saying, oh, we need a rare drink. Oh, we got strawberries. Let's make something out of strawberries. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Hey, no problem. All right. So our next segment, we got some closeout questions and they can be semi rapid fire. All right. Okay. So here we go. First one. Um, this is for everybody. Name a situation where you always overspend. And when I mean grocery situation, store. I mean store or website. Grocery store. Oh, oh this is just multifaceted. And this is supposed <laughs> to be rapid fire. Um, target for one. Damn, you can't go Hands in there. Down. Hands for, down. You go in there for yes. one thing and you yeah. come out with a $200 bill. Yeah. The other thing is when I go on a wine trip. I always overspend because I'm trying to fill up that wine so kids come back because I'm like, I might not get this no more. Tanisha, your answer is Target. Yes, and especially now because I go in and I feel like I need literally everything I see and put my hands on. Mm -hmm. So whether I use it or not, like I need it. <laughs> yep. And so I it's not like even a point to go on with a list. So <laughs> yeah, Target is the one. Yeah. Leslie, what about you? It's always Target. It's always. Even I try just buying online and it, it doesn't it does work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, those are uh no, those are all accurate. Um, so I have two. One is online, is one in person. Um, uh, my in person one is Trader Joe's. I have a real problem. I have a real problem with Trader Joe's. So I guess that falls under the grocery I'm going to agree. I think you, yeah, you do. And this is yeah. just the stuff that you post. Like, right. it's probably a bunch of stuff that is in yeah. your refrigerator and freezer that you did mm -hmm. not post. Yeah, it's and true. And I can't imagine all that was on any type of list mm -mm. that you wrote <laughs> and before have, you went in. I have a problem with going in grocery stores hungry. And that's, yeah, that's where the problem lies. Yeah. Um, my second one is Amazon. It's, it's a sinkhole for me. It's terrible. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Number two, what name? Eric did tell us his though. Oh, he said grocery store. Yeah. Oh, he grocery said grocery store. store. I'm just, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pay attention, Glenn. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, TT. <Titi. laughs> All right. Next question. Name a snack or two that you pack on a road trip. Potato chips. That's it. I like mean, potato chips. That's going to hold you down for a long road trip. Uh, oh, we're not stopping. Well, I guess. I guess. All right. That's what you're packing. <laughs> what, <chips>. like, <laughs> I'm packing forever. <laughs> <laughs> this just a snack. This is, I mean, we stopping for food, right? <laughs> but I, I think about that, Tanisha. You're on a road trip. Say you're on a family road trip and y'all leave at like, I don't know, four or five a.m. Chips is not going to hold you over to the rest stop. Okay, so probably like a couple sandwiches too. Um, okay. Yeah, sandwiches and chips. That's my thing. I don't like cold fried chicken. I'll eat cold pizza, but like you have to get a pizza before and like prepare your mind and you know, all of that <laughs> stuff. Put it in a Ziploc with foil. No. So it's going to be a sandwich. Okay. It's going to be like a hoagie style sandwich and 45 bags of chips. <laughs> Leslie, what about you? You're in you're in the car a lot. I am. Um, right, like what mix, snack you got right now? Mixed nuts. <laughs> I would okay. I would have some mixed nuts. Okay, yeah, that's healthy. Mm -hmm. Glennis, I'm not doing that. No, I don't like to drive. I don't like to drive. So I, you don't like I to ride go, either. Dr nope. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. I will fly. If, if I could fly around the corner, I would. <laughs> 
I, 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 uh, so on the plane, I always carry Pringles because the can will keep my potato chips from breaking up. Okay. Um, nuts, little nuts. I like the whole nuts idea. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, but I'm stopping. If, if I'm in the car, if I drive, it's very seldom that I drive longer than three and a half hours because that's all it's going to take me to get from here to Jersey. So I do that nonstop. If I'm drinking, of course. So did y'all have any snacks when we um did the road trip to um New York? Oh, that upstate? thing killed me. That upstate Leslie New York. had the damn. <laughs> Leslie had the damn um nuts. <laughs> Thank God. I did. I'm trying to remember what we packed, but we did stop on the way back to eat. Yeah. On the way yeah. up, we, we went straight. We went straight. Yeah. But I'm telling back. you, I usually don't like to stop. Well, my kids and I drive from Kansas City to Boston. Oh, so Jesus our, Christ. Oh, my God. Wine supplies. Ooh. Yeah. We've done that trip about three times together. Um, my son is 11 and my daughter is nine. And um, I'll pack sandwiches. I'll bake muffins and scones and capri suns and that's how we roll sandwiches that's it no 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 you're right uh what do i like i do like the nuts um i like um they're not they're not fig newtons but they're like fig just think of like um what are those bars neutral grain bars but figs Mm -hmm. so they have so just a fig newton in bar form just a long yes. fig newton right but the the outside okay. is not like uh the outside is it's like oatmeal so it's like oh, um you, like the oatmeal bavitas? around like a fig bar what you say if the bevitas no not those. no not those okay. not those but just it's think like, of it's pretty much like a nutrigrain bar yeah just think of it like a nutrigrain bar but the the flavor is fig mm-hmm. So oh. those are at Trader Joe's. Those are really good. And they hold me down for. Of course they're at Trader mm-hmm. Joe's. <laughs> they hold I love me down. Trader Joe's too. I love Trader Joe's too. Um, so either, yeah. Uh, and I like apples and I need, when I start the trip, I make a big old mug of coffee. And that usually holds mm-hmm. me down for a minute. Oh, I couldn't See, if do I that do that, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Exactly. Oh, no, I get that's, that. That's I about to that. ruin the whole thing. Yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. Yep. Me. All right. Next question for us seafood lovers, especially because Eric grew up in Boston. Name something that's unacceptable when dealing with seafood. You got to make sure your seafood is American. Living in Louisiana, Hmm. I have an appreciation for my Gulf Coast shrimp. I do not buy foreign shrimp. Um. I think I I reluctantly bought some shrimp from Ecuador when I made a gumbo a couple of years ago. But I um, yeah, but that didn't taste the same, did it, babe? It did. It did. <laughs> I mean, it was a. If that's all you got, baby. that's all you got. But try to make sure that your shrimp come from either Mississippi, Louisiana, or Texas. Um, and especially your crawfish. Yeah. Don't buy your crawfish anyplace else. If, if you can find American crawfish, that's fine. Um, Chinese crawfish, if you're in a pinch, is okay. But the taste is not going to be the same. The quality is still good because uh, I used to work with the granddaughter of the owner that imported the largest amount of crawfish from China to Louisiana. And her grandfather's standards were really high. He was... Um, they. They used to process, they used to bring in the crawfish to a Boyle's Parish, which is north of Lafayette. So if you see Chinese crawfish, it probably came from a Boyle's Parish. And it's, it's good crawfish. Mm. Well, for me, it's wet crab cakes with too much mayonnaise and too mm. much filth. So that is a, oh, that's a no, that's a stopper, no starter. It's the first thing I ask when I, are your crab cakes wet and how much filler are you using jumbo? Are you using back? Pay? Oh, mm-mm. it's it's got to be crab cakes for me. It, that's the that's mm-hmm, yeah. That's a good one. That that goes back. <laughs> like nah, money. I, I can make my <laughs> own bread. Nope. So yeah. <laughs> Leslie, I'm curious what your answer is. I don't like 
obey seasoning on my king crab legs. You know how you go to the yeah. store and they steam it for you and yeah. they want to put all that seasoning. No. Mm-mm. Just okay. keep on fine and I'll make my clarified butter at home and we're good. Got you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tanisha, do you have one? Don't. I was really sitting here thinking like what is completely unacceptable? Mm-hmm. Wet crab cake. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll yeah, say I haven't had a crab cake in forever, so like I don't even remember. Yeah, I'll say my that aspect thing. of life. Yeah, you do that. Um, this is for all seafood. Do not overcook. Take it out when you don't. When you think it's not done, take it out. Yeah. Do not overcook yeah. any seafood. I'm talking salmon. I hate overcooked salmon. Like. My uh, my husband and my brother, they will get on me because my shrimp is almost raw. Like it only needs to be pink. <laughs> it is only needs to be pink. Do not overcook any shellfish, seafood, nothing. So that's my one. All kind of foodborne diseases yeah. going on with your Listen. seafood. Is <laughs> is damn near sushi. It's fine. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> okay, just put some lemon on it. It's a ceviche. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It's Y'all fine. fine. <laughs> it's fine. It'll cook itself. Uh-oh. But you don't want no rubbery lobster. Oh, if you over oh, the you cook lobster. Oh, yeah. The thing it's is, is rubbery and dry. I didn't eat, I didn't eat lobster for years because I went to a place and it was overcooked, and I assumed, and I was very young, and I assumed that lobster would be rubbery. Like, ah, it's too tough. No, nah, I don't like lobster. And so yeah. I had really yeah, well, well like food. perfectly cooked <laughs> lobster. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> I've been misled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you missed out on a good cake. portion of life. Yes. Wow. That's okay so we can move it to the next one name one thing that you put honey on Popeye's biscuits oh you put honey on your biscuits from Popeye's mm-hmm. okay it's delicious I feel like that's fancy most black people just put strawberry jam on it Mm-mm. girl they give you honey packets oh, I'm putting it right on there um, have you had what is it that it's the the hard honey, the spreadable honey, honey. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh, what's honey that? Spread. Yeah. Honey spread, yeah. It's yeah, it's, all- it's it's honey, but it's not um liquid, and you okay. can spread it like you can spread it like a jam or a, a butter, and I like that on toast or on okay. like on a stove. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Eric, what about you? I'm very curious. We use honey a lot in baked goods. Um, I, I put it on my toast in the morning. And then when my kids and I travel to Massachusetts or to Louisiana, we stop in uh, little gas stations and buy whatever honey is available from that county. So my children and I have become honey connoisseurs. <laughs> um. I basically use most of my honey in tea. Oh, nice. Um, I get this honey, this peach honey Mm -hmm. from this elderberry company. It's so good. So I just use that in in, in the tea. And I have put it on biscuits before as well. But for the majority, I don't eat biscuits all the time because I would be a biscuit myself or a half loaf. So I just use um, hidden tea for the most part. Oh, Sarita, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, my answer is fried chicken, uh, especially for brunch. Um, mm-hmm. I like when um, the fried chicken has like um, cayenne, cayenne, so it's spicy, and then you just sort of drizzle honey on it. And so it's like a yeah. sweet and savory kind of thing. So that's my answer. That's good. I've had that before. Yeah, especially if you get chicken and waffles. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. All right. Last question is for Eric. Um, what cocktails do you make with your honey? Y'all know I never made a cocktail before. What you mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. 
<laughs> you about to I, hurt Serena's feelings. <laughs> I don't. All those ingredients you have? Are you kidding? I'm 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 so serious. We don't. I think I may have helped my aunts mix vodka and cranberry juice. Oh my god! And you make ginger one time beer when I was a child. But I don't. I don't know how to make cocktails. Wow. wow. I oh. never made even when I was in college. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't like. I remember one time I had a Long Island iced tea and I nearly lost my mind. Okay. I so is it? Do you, do you not drink hard liquor? I do. I'll keep a bottle for years and I'll okay. just go and take a little swig of it every now and then. But hmm. um, we always have hard cider, mead, and homemade grape wine in the okay. basement. So we'll just go downstairs and grab something like that. Okay. Cocktails. I never made it. <laughs> challenge accepted. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make something with honey and I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> that be the recipe. Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will do, sir. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thanks, thank you Eric. For the invitation. Oh. Well, Eric, thank you so much for thank you for reaching out to us. Uh thank you for being on the show. And I'm gonna reach reach out to the folks that you sent me for the VESTA program so they can come on the show and tell us a lot more about it. Yeah. Thank but y'all thank for you. having this podcast. I've been I've enjoyed listening to y'all on my back <laughs> and forth trips to Wham Eagle because it's a two hour trip each way mm. <laughs> just to make this stuff. So I've been very entertained listening to you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm by, by these shenanigans, sure. we're, we're sorry. <laughs> we're just gonna apologize for that. <laughs> Not us. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, we appreciate that. My kids from after school. Okay. Uh, All right. I you have a good have evening. A great Tuesday night. You too. You bye too. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank All right. you. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye bye. Well, that is our show, everybody. We hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned something new today. Don't forget to rate us and leave us five stars. We love comments. Send us an email. Follow us on social media. Enjoy the rest of your week. Cheers. <laughs>